Namaste and greetings. I, Kwaish Kavyan, researcher at IMFRI Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Eva Meethi Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMFRI hashtag Web Policy Talk. Today, we are gathered for a panel discussion on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, implications for India and emerging geopolitics, which is a part of the State of International Affairs hashtag Diplomacy Dialogue Series. This event is organized by IMFRI Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies. I would like to extend a warm welcome to our invitees for the discussion. Chairing the panel discussion is Ambassador Anantri Gunyat, retired IFS, former Ambassador to Jordan, Libya and Malta, former Deputy Chief of Mission Embassy of India, Moscow. We welcome you, sir. Moving team panelists with us, Professor Guru Pardu, Nikhil Professor and Professor Nikhil. We are delighted us, Dr. Chakravarti, strategic thinker on security issues. We also extend a warm welcome to P.K. Arun, senior journalist and columnist. We are pleased to joined by His Excellency Freddy Savar, Ambassador, Royal Danish Embassy in New Delhi. Our moderator is Dr. Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director, IMFRI. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you, Kwahish, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to this very important discussion on Russia's special military operation into the sovereign territory of Ukraine, its implications on geopolitics and India. We are joined by distinguished experts who have been closely following the state of current affairs. Today marks the 19th day of Russia's invasion on Ukraine and has been purported to be the most dangerous international conflict since the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Several political leaders, observers, and others have raised concerns of escalation to a broader war with NATO allies that could possibly involve nuclear weapons. While such a war is far from inevitable, the possibility of the current conflict spiraling beyond the immediate theater of hostilities is real. Thus, understanding its root causes, what all is at stake for Ukraine, Russia, India, and rest of the world, and what might happen next is essential if we are to prevent the war from getting further worse, and instead of finding a way to bring it to a close. It is therefore very important, and which is why today, under the guidance of Ambassador Anil Trigunayat, we are having this panel discussion with distinguished experts. Thank you all for tuning in and get ready for an in-depth discussion. I now welcome Ambassador Trigunayat to share his opening remarks and invite the panelists thereafter. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mehta. Uh, thank you, IMPRI, for organizing this very timely and topical uh, webinar uh, on a challenge that everybody is facing, the whole world is facing. No, no single country is immune from its impact and its effect. I'm so grateful to you for allowing me to moderate this session as such distinguished panelists are there. So therefore, I would not take much time. And His Excellency, my dear friend, Ambassador Freddy Swan has also joined. So he'll bring us a European perspective. Uh, we have Professor Dr. Sidhu who can tell us how the Americans are thinking since he's sitting in New York. And of course, uh, General Chakravarti and uh, Mr. Arun, both are very distinguished strategists. So one can tell us about the military dimension, other how the other side of India thinks. Perhaps Mr. Arun can dwell on that. Uh, to begin with, I would like to just say first word, and that is wars are evil. There is absolutely no denying the fact. No war has ever brought peace and prosperity to any country, Be starting from plunder to whatever purpose, objective any country may have. Diplomacy and dialogue are the only way in which today the world can live. But then we have seen the superpowers have their own dynamic, always. We had seen what happened during the Cold War. We have seen that there have been regime change agendas. We have also witnessed, and I have it myself, there and seen in different parts uh, when Iraq was invaded, when Libya was bombed, when Yemen, Syria, they're still happening. But no one in the world actually thought in recent times 
that there could be a war in Europe. That was something people thought by First World War, World War I is over, World War II is over, both started and actually finished there in Europe to a great uh, degree of uh, destruction for all the countries in the region. Russia itself, which used to be Soviet Union at the time, Second World War, lost 26 million people, one from every household. And the Soviets, at that time, Ukraine was part of it, and have also equally suffered. And therefore, war has never solved any problem for any time. It may be just temporary. So we, what we are witnessing today is that is happening. On the other hand, we are also seeing that it is not a war between Moscow and Kiev. It is the war, it's a geopolitics at play. And as I say, the geopolitics at its worst. This has been, in my view, a conflict for geopolitical and geoeconomic competition between the two superpowers. One hyperpower, the other is a superpower. Another thing that we are seeing is this is the first full-fledged hybrid warfare that is taking place in the world today. And it will change the way the world is looked at. The change way that we are going to actually uh, see after this war is actually over, uh, that how the new equations will emerge. Hopefully there'll be no further escalation beyond uh, this localized warfare. That is the biggest threat to the world because if that happens, then we are into a very different kind of a dynamic and no one wants that. I hope Russians don't want that. I hope Europeans and Americans don't want that. But then the wars as we have seen from the history of the previous world wars, they have happened on a very small pretext. Sometimes by design, sometimes by default, sometimes by just a small incendiary light that inflates them. And so therefore, it is an important thing that the, the, all the countries in the world must try and resolve this crisis to the extent possible. Uh, there are many things and I'm quite sure the experts will speak about the nuances of this. I won't take much time because Ambassador Swan has to also leave. I, one thing I would like to say is that very often we are hearing the uh, India's vote in the United Nations Security Council. A lot of people are discussing and debating it. I look at it differently. I'm not looking at it from the point of view of India's special and privileged strategic partnership with Russia, its dependencies with Russia or the erstwhile Soviet Union in the United States. Looking at India's uh, global comprehensive strategic partnership with uh, United States, nor am I looking at it from the point of view that Ukraine, uh, through its history, has never supported India on anything. What I am looking at it from where India stands, I think that India's vote was the most sensible vote. It was in keeping with its history, its philosophy, and its adherence to the UN Charter as well as to the dialogue and diplomacy. Very often one considers abstention as neutrality. That is far from truth. If that was the case, then India would not have continued it after some time. But India continues on the matter of principle because it knows for sure that by accusing A side or B side or siding with the another side, it is not going to serve the purpose, neither of the peace nor of the humanity. When it asks, it clearly, uh, if you were to read the statement that came out of India explaining its vote at the UN Security Council, it very clearly spoke about the plight of the Ukraine, ordinary Ukrainians who were facing it, or for that matter, anybody who's dying in this war. Secondly, it also talked about the respect of sovereignty and territorial integrity. India has never, in its history, modern history, has never supported external military intervention, whether it was by the United States or as whether it is by Russians. It has always, overtly or covertly, has always told uh, the powers that they're wrong and the dialogue and diplomacy should be there. So it has done that. Prime Minister Modi has spoken to 11 leaders, including the Quad leaders, and explained India's position and told that direct dialogue should happen. Of course, India's biggest interest in this and for any country that would be was its own citizens, 20,000 odd citizens who were there. That was your primary concern. 
and I have been in Libya and how we had evacuated Indians during that period. Uh, I know it, how difficult it is. And if you take a side, what do you do? You expose one or the other for nothing. And you are gaining nothing. The cause of peace is not gaining. Cause of diplomacy is not gaining because both sides are standing eye to eye, eyeball to eyeball, not willing to blink. They did not give chance to diplomacy when the time was there. And when the time is up, then we cannot accuse because that does not serve any purpose. It only history books will be written who's right, who's wrong. But hopefully there will be some way and there is a little hope coming out of the discussions by the uh, several countries are trying to do that. How I look at the geopolitics, I look at it now that in my view, I think we are looking while the transatlantic alliance is becoming stronger uh, because of this particular threat from Russia uh, that they felt was there. We have seen weaponization of the financial instruments. That is something very new this time. And of we in, in, in our Indian context, we call it Brahmastra. So I think this Brahmastra has been launched by the Western countries, especially the United States, which is sitting far off, which is not dependent on oil and gas, which is not dependent on many things. Yet it is the Europeans and the Russia considers itself as a part of Europe first, would move towards into the Asian bracket a little more in that sense. So what we are looking at in my view is that perhaps we are looking at a Cold War 2.0 scenario with a much, much, uh, I would say, uh, stronger vehemence of opposition and fight for technology with Sino-Russian access emerging very strong. In the Middle East, I always say a new kind of a, a scenario might uh, evolve that is Scriptak, China, Russia, Iran, Pakistan, Turkey, uh, Afghanistan, those that kind of a grouping can emerge uh, and then the US led other grouping. But it seems to me now with this war, which was not expected so soon by anybody, uh, I think that uh, these kind of alliances might become it. Where does India stand on that? I think in India today, again, is at the crossroads as it was in 1947. India does not like the word alliance. So I have been propagating and today, 90% of the countries in the Middle East, in Africa, I've spoken to a lot of African ambassadors and uh, even my friends from different political spectrum and different parts of the world. And they say that we don't want to be part of this Cold War game. We don't want to be a part of this superpower rivalries. It's not a question. Everybody hates this humanitarian catastrophe, which is unfolding now today. But at the same time, nobody wants to become a screw in this uh, square peg. So I believe that India has yet again a possibility, and I hope we take action. We have talked to uh, Zelensky, Putin, and all kinds of leaders at every time during this period that India could have done a little more, in my view. Well, it is for the leadership to decide what they want to do. But henceforth, going forward, I think we should try to work on something called Nations for Strategic Autonomy, NSA a new kind of thing. We must think about what we are. And I want to tell people here in this, uh, those who are attending, that India is no longer the India of 1947 when it led from the front. It was weak. It had come out of colonialism. There was a cause of anti-colonialism that was there. Today, it is a cause of a strategic autonomy. Multi-alignments are fine with that. But at the same time, what India can do is you are the second largest uh, population in the world. You are the second biggest market in the world. You are the uh, one sixth of the population in the world. You have biggest market in the world, even for those defense people, because 90% of the time, the war are, wars are driven by the defense lobbies in these countries. So I think that we have a possibility and a very large number of countries will support that venture. And then we'll be able to wait through. I'll stop here. And now I'd like to invite a very distinguished uh, professor who has also been uh, involved with UN uh, matters, especially in the nuclear field. And we have heard uh, the, the, the unspeakable has been spoken about the, <laughs> the nuclear uh, arms and use of those threats have been uh, somehow flagged. Uh, so uh, Dr. Sidhu, early morning, good morning, very good morning to you. Now the floor is yours, please 10 to 15 minutes. And then I'll request uh, Ambassador Swan to take the floor.
Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Tignath. Uh, you know, I was actually uh, assuming that I would come in a little later, but I'm, I'm happy to go now. And I certainly won't go for uh, 15 minutes. I'll, I'll be much, much shorter uh, than that. I think, um, you know, my, my brief was to really talk about this from two perspectives. One, in some ways, from the perspective of the United States. And second, uh, from the perspective, if you like, of uh, obviously US-India uh, relations as well. Um, and the abstention is one part of that, but obviously there's a wider, bigger geopolitical uh, di dimension and dynamics to that. Um, I mean, broadly speaking, I think in the, in, in the, you know, for most countries, there are, if you like, three um, lenses through which they look at any kind of uh, global uh, commitment or interaction, including the kind of uh, you know, military operations that we're, we're talking about. Uh, the first is obviously national interest. Uh, and you know, in the sense of trying to promote and advance your own security, your own interest, that has been a very uh, you know, primary sort of driver for, for many, many, uh, many countries. In fact, you know, one would, one would argue almost every country as well. Second, I think there's also this element of wanting uh, to preserve the rule-based order, uh, which happens to be, uh, you know, Western liberal in, in, in its con connotation, but very much a preservation of that. So this is something that you might sort of call, uh, you know, wars or conflicts of value. Uh, the third is, of course, uh, you know, the element of humanitarian uh, di dynamics, you know, which very much drives, uh, drives this kind of thinking as, as well. Now, uh, obviously, there's a hierarchy among them, but if, you, if, if there's a convergence between these three lenses, that's when you sort of see a greater sort of uh, domestic and other support uh, for that uh, action. Uh, and here, obviously, you know, in the case of the United States, uh, the invasion of uh, uh, Ukraine, as, as your title says, uh, it really does kind of cover all three of those lenses. Uh, it is in the US national interest. It is a humanitarian issue, as, uh, as Ambassador Yu mentioned as well. And it does challenge, uh, frankly, uh, the UN Charter. Uh, you know, Article 2.4, uh, this is a blatant violation of, of that. Of course, we know this is not the first, uh, you know, uh, permanent member of the UN Security Council to violate the charter in that sense. Unfortunately, it's probably not the last. But that in no way absolves this particular action of uh, Russia. And I think that is the kind of context that we need to think about it and, and where the United States is very much uh, coming uh, you know, into, this, into this discussion uh, as well. Uh, mind you, this is not something that the US was very keen on at all. Uh, and that's why I think very unusually, uh, and I'm sure uh, General Chakravarti will talk to this a little bit further as well, the amount of uh, intelligence that they shared uh, in trying to prevent this conflict uh, was really exceptional. It actually made a lot of people in the Pentagon very uncomfortable as to the number of kind of weapons and equipment which was being deployed, uh, both on the side of the United States and NATO, but also on the Russian side as well, essentially saying, look, we, we know exactly what you're doing. And so, you know, this was not going to be uh, a, a Crimea 2.0. Uh, where it was really by stealth and, you know. All... Now, against that context, uh, let, me, let me sort of then turn in, in, in some ways to uh, the, and, and, and before I turn to the abstention issue, uh, I, I also just want to, uh, you know, in some ways sort of flag from the Indian perspective, if you like, um, that not of its own choice of wanting, uh, Soviet, and Russian actions have sometimes put India in very much of a bind. Uh, you know, think for example about Afghanistan. Uh, you know, is another is another instance that you had uh, India being put in a very awkward situation. And uh, Ambassador, you're absolutely right in pointing out how India.
tried very, uh, maybe not overtly, but certainly covertly to raise that issue. But there was a more fundamental issue there as well. And this in some ways links up to the idea that you had of the uh, you know, nations for strategic autonomy. Uh, and you know, which I'll, which I'll come to in, in just a minute as well. Um, from 1979 onwards, uh, and then again, this was repeated when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. And suddenly, you know, uh, and again, I'm, I'm sure um, Mr. Arun and uh, General Chakravarti will talk to this, how there was a big quandary about uh, trying to ensure the weapon supplies particularly from the former Soviet Union and the whole discussion and debate with Ukraine as well. But the point I want to make is that during that time, if you recall, uh, India very consciously and very deliberately tried to get out of an all Soviet uh, equipment setting. And between, uh, during the 1980s in particular, uh, you saw India going out on a shopping spree, particularly to Europe. Uh, picking up aircraft carrier and aircraft from uh, the United Kingdom, submarines from Germany, uh, guns from Sweden, uh, you know, French aircraft, Italian torpedoes, uh, and, and you, you name it, right? I mean, it was, and this was really to try and create a degree of autonomy, if you like, of flexibility, so that you're not, you're, all your eggs are not in, at that point of time, the Soviet basket. Uh, that, of course, also led in some ways, I would argue, to the economic reforms in 1991, because the spree led to, uh, you know, a certain degree of, uh, you know, outflow, which India was not in a position to pay right away. So I put that in the context of sort of saying, perhaps this again provides India an opportunity to think about diversification, because that is what would really kind of underline this element of, of autonomy uh, as, as, as well. This then brings me to your, your, your central question, and I promise I'll, 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 I'll keep quiet after that, is uh, the issue of abstention. Um, I think there are two aspects to the abstention. Uh, the first is the way that it has come across uh, in the sense that it is almost being seen as a negative vote, whereas in a way, you know, uh, abstention is really much more neutral uh, and it, the key element of the abstention is it did not prevent any of those resolutions going forward. Uh, it in, in no way sort of, uh, you know, stopped that, uh, you know, the General Assembly resolution as well, even though uh, there, was, there was an abstention there. However, that being said, and, and, uh, and, and I think the explanation of what does a decent job of trying to provide some of the Indian nuances, but that being said, uh, you know, the uh, US polity, very much like the Indian polity, is not always given to nuances. Uh, and again, I think, you know, you can, you can see this playing out in two sort of ways. Um, in the administration, um, let, let me back up a little bit, because I think, as you, again, right, as you rightly said, you know, US-India relations have been on an upward trajectory. Uh, you know, really to a, since the end of 1991 and well beyond that as well. The only thing which is determined by the administration of the day is the pace of that trajectory. Uh, but otherwise, it is very much going in, in one direction. That being said, I think you, you now also see, uh, you know, a, a deepening of India's kind of relationship with the United States, which goes beyond just the establishment, and by which I mean the government. There are at least three actors that India needs to think about. Uh, number one is, if you like the government, and I'll come to that in a minute. Second, uh, the corporate sector. And third, the diaspora. Uh, by which I mean uh, the, you know, American Indians, if you like, or, or Indian Americans, uh, you know, uh, who, who are now increasingly playing a significant role uh, here as well. On the government front, I think while there is a much better understanding on the part of the administration of India's position, which is why you saw uh, that even in the quad uh, emergency quad meeting, which was called uh, just in the beginning of March, India was not uh, forced to put into a corner on its position of, you know, not supporting the rule-based law uh, or the rule-based order in Europe while wanting to support it in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, you know, that nuance was understood and appreciated. I think, but that is, the challenge is going to be 
in the Congress. Uh, because in the Congress is where you have uh, a lot of people, uh, and we saw this particularly also in the case vis-a-vis -vis, uh, India's position on Iran, and the same sort of situation, if you like, uh, is going to be the case in Ukraine as well. I think uh, India is going to come under much greater scrutiny uh, on the part of its uh, abstention, particularly for the kind of exemptions it's seeking for military equipment from Russia, and in particular, the S-400. Uh, and I think that's really going to be, uh, you know, a critical kind of uh, element uh, for, uh, for, for India's own sort of uh, security and the geopolitics as well. And how India, uh, you know, traverses that, I think is going to be a, 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 a real sort of challenge. Let me end, if I might, by picking up a point um, uh, you talked about, Ambassador, in how India might sort of play a role uh, in, in, this, in this unfolding uh, scenario. One element, I think, which has, hasn't been recognized, and I'm, I'm glad you, you, you picked it up, is uh, this, the non-aligned element. Uh, as you saw in the General Assembly uh, vote, there were 35 abstentions. That is an incredibly high number uh, of abstentions. And those abstentions are both problematic uh, for the Russians because many of uh, Russia's so-called allies chose to abstain rather than support it, uh, which is very, uh, if you're sitting in Moscow, very worrying. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's also this recognition that there are countries which don't want to be caught in, in this imbroglio going forward as well because of the development uh, dynamics and dimension there as well. And I think there certainly India has a role to play uh, and something that it should build up. But so far, we have seen that India has been missing in action. Uh, you've seen Turkey play a role. Uh, you have seen, uh, you know, of course, China being talked about as, as one sort of go-between. Even Israel uh, has, has been talked about. But India, uh, you know, apart from sort of obviously looking after the interests of its own citizens, which is absolutely paramount, uh, has probably not done as much as it could. So it's talking the talk of dialogue, which I completely agree with, but it hasn't walked that walk yet. Uh, let me stop there, Ambassador. There's much more to cover, but uh, I'll leave it for the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Siddhu, for pointing out many things. And I agree uh, on this. Perhaps we could have done much more, been a little more proactive. Uh, what we stood for, that is something. But we'll discuss that. But now that we know that Ambassador Swan has to go for some meeting, uh, and he's already in the car. So I'll request Ambassador to please take the floor and share your thoughts. I take the wheel, uh, dear friends, and uh, dear Anil, uh, thank you very, very much for inviting me. Uh, I think it's a very, very important uh, juncture in the new world order, but it's also a very important juncture for humanity and, of course, for all the democracies around the world. Uh, Anil, you uh, really touched upon, I think, two very, very important aspects, uh, one being uh, dear politics and dear e economics. And I think these two things that are joined as well as uh, separated will play a huge role in the future. Uh, and we have also seen that the uh, uh, aggression of Russia, which we have condemned uh, from, from uh, EU uh, very, very strongly, that this will lead to a new world order, definitely. But we also seen that Europe has changed overnight. Uh, what we have been discussing, some have been hoping for for many, many years, in fact, happened over over uh, just uh, the night, so to say. 24-7, uh, Europe changed its uh, equation, so to say. There are no more any fractures to be seen uh, within the European Union and in Europe as such. Uh, nature is uh, much more cemented uh, than before. And the transatlantic relationship has really also uh, changed uh, dramatically. So uh, what we are now facing is a totally united Europe and the uh, US. And add to that, a lot of countries, uh, Japan as an example, Australia as another example. So uh, I think we will see a world order, which is very, very different, but also uh, challenging for the uh, for rest of the world, so to say. 
Uh, I think we all know the reason why India abstained, um, and I'm not here and will not, has never really, I have never really criticized India. Of course, we had our expectations, and that's, uh, I think, very, very important to have expectations. And India is always uh, uh, highlighting the uh, democratic values, the uh, rule of law, multilateralism, and all that. I think that. Uh, a recipe for a future growth that uh, will also uh, create a better better platform for India. But India has its history, India has its uh, legacy and so forth. Uh, and I would also like to join the calls that India could have done more. But of course, it's, uh, it's up to the leadership out here to define what kind of role India will take. Um, of course, everybody will look into uh, uh, to serve its nationals, and of course, India had to evacuate and get all these 20,000 students out of uh, of Ukraine. Uh, it goes without saying, everybody is doing that and should be doing that. But in the longer run, I think uh, we have to look into what are the trends of the situation that we have seen emerging. Um, it goes without saying that uh, Russia is uh, much more isolated than ever before. And perhaps some of the contacts that they were looking into uh, before making that kind of decision, they had not the slightest idea of what you, how Europe would act and how U.S. will act, how Japan will act and so forth. So there's a new equation emerging here. The other part is, of course, uh, who will benefit in a larger picture from, from uh, this conflict and hopefully it will end uh, uh, sooner uh, rather than later. But um, you have a big neighbor uh, very close to you, and um, uh, how will they be uh, be placed here? How are they evaluating the situation and so forth? And some uh, will be arguing that um, what we have seen, Russia and China might find a, a stronger uh, kind of uh, coherence. Uh, will that be a, a comfort to India? Will that be a comfort to the rest of the world? I'm not so sure, and therefore, um, India will have to make a call one way or another where they see themselves. I have noticed with, uh, with great interest how your foreign minister, uh, he placed himself in the Quad foreign ministers meet and so forth, talking about uh, what is within the re uh, geography of, of Quad and so forth. I think it's understandable and so forth. But the context for all of us have changed, has changed dramatically for all the European countries, for US, but also for India. The context is no longer what it used to be, whether it was uh, from uh, 47 onwards and even 10 years ago and so forth. So the demands being put upon the democracies of the world has changed drastically. And I think, uh, of course, India, um, the Indian way is an important way. But it cannot just be how it was early on because the context at that time was very different. Today, it's really a different context. And uh, uh, India is really aiming for this five trillion US dollar economy. So that's a big issue. How will you reach to that uh, uh, level of an economy? How will you do the green uh, tra transition and all that? So basically, my conclusion, my private conclusion is that dependencies uh, will have to be reduced to also to be loyal to your own strategy, namely what you could call the Indian way. So uh, India will have to define much more clearly, much more strategically its own interests and navigating um, not with words, but with acts and, and actions. So that's uh, how I see it. But no doubt Europe stands united, US stands uh, united, Japan, all these countries uh, will stand united. And of course, the number of, of uh, countries abstaining in the, within the UN, uh, of course, it's a high number. But if you look into democracies, how many democracies abstained, then the numbers are very, very small. And perhaps there's also a kind of wake up call, where do you place yourself? But you know, I'm not here to tell India what to do. I'm, uh, of course, uh, understanding the uh, context of India, but but uh, today's world with a very very uh, interconnected uh, uh, dear uh, political situation, dear economical situation, will leave uh, less space to navigate as uh, one did uh, 20 years ago, 30 years, 40 years ago. 
So the world has changed and will be much more demanding. And uh, I took some interest in the wording of your honorable prime minister in, in, uh, in uh, Gujarat, uh, both in Hindi and Urdu, he mentioned uh, war. So uh, uh, at, at least the honorable prime minister is seeing the uh, situation in Ukraine, Ukraine as a war. And uh, war is, has never produced anything but sufferings and losses and so forth. So I think uh, your prime minister has now uh, uh, correctly understood the situation. But it's up to uh, India to define what kind of role you would like to pursue. And I'm not to criticize anybody here, but uh, context has changed and India will also have to take uh, a strong look into the new context and where to be placed in the future if Russia, China is getting closer and closer. Where will India then position yourself? So uh, I think that's uh, what I can say from the car still running on the wheels. So thank you very much indeed. That's thank you, thank you, Ambassador. <coughs> very, thank you. Very, very succinct comments and very apt. Uh, and I fully agree with you that Prime Minister Modi, even in his first discussion, when he spoke to President Putin, he very clearly told him to seize the hostilities and return to the table. And in fact, uh, many people have not, but as diplomats, we know when you see the explanation of vote, you have to see what is not mentioned rather than what is mentioned. And so you have to read between the lines and the Russians very clearly understood what India meant by that. And I have always said it that, I, I tell you one small example. Uh, when I was in Libya at that time, we had abstained against the, uh, the NATO intervention in Libya which was supposed to be right to protect. And of course, there are previous examples in Iraq where the, the uh, credibility <clears throat> of the Western countries were at stake and millions of people have died in that process. So at that time, I know that how the narrative was created that India was with Gaddafi, just because we said we don't, we oppose the external intervention, military intervention. So this is also some, that's why I'm saying this is probably the first full scale a uh, full-fledged war which is taking place where the Americans have an edge of thoughts that they have weaponized their financial architecture to this extent that Russia will be cornered, no doubt. It will be terribly affected, but so will the rest of the world. And how long the Europeans in the near term take it, that will decide exactly the way things are going to move. Well, thank you so much once again, Ambassador. You've taken so your time. So kind of you to have joined us. Now I'll request uh, uh, Mayor General uh, Dr. D.K. Chakravarti. So I think he's more of Dr. Doctor because he's a strategic, a very well-known strategist. Sir, please share your thoughts <clears throat> as to how you see this war panning out. And uh, <clears throat> do you see that uh, the Russia has actually overstretched itself uh, rather than uh, or its calculations have not been gone the way they wished it? from a strategist point of view. Floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Trugnet. And thank you so much, Professor Sidhu. And also thank Ambassador Swan for his comments. All that I would say, I am in agreement with all of you. Military people certainly don't like wars. And I think we agree with you that after all, we don't like wars. But as I'll quote Clausewitz, since Ambassador belongs to Europe, War is a continuation of politics, political dimension by other means. So it's not something which is, you know, that anybody likes or does not want or want. It is something which is done. And all the definitions of war, even if you use Ambassador Tugnet spoke of hybrid war, they don't emanate in India. They don't emanate in Russia. They don't emanate in China. Professor Sidhu, they emanate in the United States. I have been contesting these definitions. I've been meeting all generals from all countries, China, Russia, you name it, United States, UK, you know, the NATO, and been meeting them. And I must share with you that all of us look at things in the same way. Firstly, let me clear, you know, about this issue about Professor Sidhu saying that we haven't tried to open up our Soviet basket. Personally, I have been involved deeply with the United States. We got the NTP 237. I know how difficult it is to deal with the United States. The US feels, you know, that India doesn't do too much. 
I remember even telling the US, Indian embassy in US how difficult it is. I, we got the ultralight houses. We had a conference in the US embassy in New Delhi. There were 37 people from so many countries of the US taking part. When you deal with Russia, you have one agency, you have one place, you have the Indian embassy in Moscow, you have a Rosoboron export, and sometimes you don't have it, like in the case of Brahmo's missiles. So I'm giving you clearly. And you can get it through. With the US, you have people, people have come and told me, don't expect technology from the United States. Americans have told us, please get it from Russia. What, where do we go? Please, we'll, we'll talk about the war, which is, which is a very easy thing for me. Where do we get a nuclear submarine? Where do we get today our space sector going? Where do we get everything? Yes, Americans are given as a P8I. They have given, they were supposed to give us the Guardian, what you call UAV. Now again, the predator. These are issues under deep control. Very easy to say, you want even a tire from the United States. We have to get tires for the NTP 37. Believe me, I told the American general over the Jesus, this is utterly shameful. This is an American talking about American procedures. I know all your procedures backwards. Ultimately, I put my own Jeep tires, which we make in India. We have to use the Ludhiana tactics for the US equipment. And it works very well for European equipment. I'm trained in Europe. I'm trained in Sweden, got the Bofors gun. So I know Europe very well. I know the United States a bit too well. Possibly many Americans don't know how the United States procedures are. I'll just tell you, I heard President Trump, he was a former president. He must have been elected by majority of the people. Many say the Russians have manipulated the United States. I think it's really credible if the United States, Russia can still, even now, I heard CNN only yesterday and they said, you know, the way Russia could manip manipulate 2016 in the United States. I think if they could do that, uh, then something is wrong with all of us. Well, coming on to it, India has done its best. And let me put it very, very clearly. We have got strategic autonomy, which Ambassador Tugnaita very, very correctly described. I wouldn't like to go into further details. We look at the situation that the war must cease and it should do it. Now, what did the Russians do? Well, the Russians are not fighting the war today. I'm just saying as a military analyst, War started in December 1991, 25th December 1991. With the breakup of the Soviet Union, the war started. So how many years now? 31 years. Let's take one by one the event specific to Ukraine. We will not go here and there. First was the Black Sea Fleet lay in Crimea. Without the Black Sea Fleet today, the Russia or, or does not have warm waters. So what did Boris Yeltsin do? He declared that the Black Sea Fleet is a part of Russia. Ukraine accepted it. Next comes the most important decision which took place in 1994. There were nuclear weapons in Ukraine. They were removed by Russia. So 1994 is the next turning point. And then comes, you see, 2015, where today without a shot being fired, General Garis Morvo continues to be the chief of general staff from 2012. I don't think any general has continued into service from 2012 and today is 2022. He applied the Garis Morvo doctrine and you had today Crimea. I mean, when you're talking of Crimea, I'm talking of Sevastopol and I will not name all the details of the places coming into you. And then in April, the Donbass region comes in. Well, this is the way it has been developing. And then you have had the, what you call the elections over there, and you have had these regions coming. Then you have had the Russian army going in. They have been triggering. So are everybody doing. Today, I just now received a WhatsApp that 250,000 hackers from the West are working to ensure that there are false pictures coming to me. I'm just giving you, you may be feeling Russia is achieving nothing. So let's take on all these issues in a little, you know, possibly in a more correct perspective. Why does Russia need, Russia, Putin said one thing, there will be no war if Ukraine does not join NATO. I'm repeating it, he has said it many times. If today Ukraine doesn't join NATO, there's no war. And then obviously you, you keep changing goalposts, he made it, you should not join the European Union and all this. So when you don't do it, well, he started with 
initial objectives, pronounced objectives as Donbass. Definitely, Donbass will not yield him that NATO objective. So he started four offensives, which you all know, one heading from Belarus onto Kyiv, the second going on to Kharkiv, the third going on to Donbass, and the fourth is coming from the south from Crimea. What was the aim? The aim was to make the political leadership realize that there is no point of going with the West. Today, you have Zelensky himself saying, there is no place for us in NATO. I have heard him myself. Now, again, you'll say that he may not have said it. Somebody else has said it. Now, well, it's very difficult to say who is saying what and who is not talking what. Since we belong to the military, we know who speaks the truth and who does not speak the truth. And generally, it is very difficult to know who is speaking the truth. But the fact remains that today, at least, they are meeting at Anatolia, which is in Turkey. And they have had the first round. The second round is also possibly going to take place. And you'll see and soon see what has happened militarily. Let's get the situation right. If you look at it, Russian military objectives have already been achieved. What have they got to do now? They have to win at the peace table. When you keep, when you have to win at that table, which is in Turkey, all right. And don't forget, Turkey may be a part that you are feeling very happy. Europe is united, America is united. Believe me, I see a number of channels of the United States, Sidhu, sir. And with due respect, there are contradicting remarks in each channel. You see Fox, you see CNN, believe me or not, it looks like as if they are channels of two separate countries. The Democrat view is one, the Republican view is not totally what, what you call, what a few senators from the Republican are saying or a few House reps are saying. You know what Trump is saying from Mar-a-Lago in Florida. If you want, I've got the statements in writing. And he's still saying Putin is a nice man. I do not know. He was the former president. He still provided security by the United States of America. And then you are calling Putin a dictator. You have supported so many dictators. The United States, I can name you so many dictators have been supported. Well, I am not a diplomat and certainly I don't want to extend the war on the television screen. But certainly I would like to say I was posted in Vietnam and with the American defense attache, because I was a very important man in Vietnam. I was posted from 1996 to 1999. We even bought bread from Bangkok. So I know what sanctions are. But believe me, if you think that sanctions are going to kill a nation, sanctions are going to, believe me or not, uh, India also has been under sanctions. I don't know if some sanctions are still continuing for India. I once checked up. And as much as three years back, there were certain sanctions which were still continuing which I brought it to the attention of the government. And being a retired person, it was easier to do it because you went through the websites. So US sanctions, European, by the way, Europe has not yet, what you call, put any sanctions on gas or they have not put any sanctions on petrol because the day you do it, Europe collapses. So what are we talking about the so-called United Alliances and other things? Was Trump somebody who was not elected by the United States? Even now, when I play golf with people who have come from Americans in New Delhi, many of them are still feel that the Trump policies were good. When I go to the United States, I still find a large section of people who still believe. And even if you take the voting which took place, a fair amount voted for Trump. It is not that it has been a majority which you can see. So even the US is concerned, as far as European nations are concerned, why is Macron talking to Putin? Why is the German chancellor talking to Putin? And what is Putin doing? I think out of all the leaders, possibly militarily, the most calibrated is Putin. Let me put it to you militarily. You ask anybody, let me see one military person who says that he has achieved nothing. Let me see, yes, I agree, there is no air superiority. I agree there is no favorable air situation. I agree that Turkey has supplied certain new caps which are doing a great job in today taking on Russian convoys. But by and large, a lot of restraint is being shown by the Russians. Let me put it to you. Imagine today 2.1 million Ukrainians have been able to go safely out of the country. It's only yesterday that they have started dealing with Lviv. 
I think the best answer is, which I look at, I don't hear any challenge. What, having served in an Indian embassy, what is the location of the Indian embassy today? It's in Poland. It was first in Kiev, from Kiev it moved to Lviv, and today it's in Poland. While the Indian embassy, I'm the ambassador tonight is sitting here, let me tell you, I have been a part, and I remember in Cambodia things, nobody allows you to evacuate unless things are really bad. So situation as it stands today, you have Kiev, which is contained, reaching isolation. These are military terms I'm using now. Kharkiv is almost isolated. As far as the Moria Pol is concerned, it's isolated, could lead to investment, leading to capture. Possibly they don't want to capture all this. I'm sharing with you now. Certainly not interested. They want two assurances. They don't want NATO at their door. Now you all spoke about God. Is it very happy if today China comes and sits in Sri Lanka or China comes and sits even in Myanmar? Is it acceptable to a to me military? Is it acceptable that they come and sit in Nepal? Is it acceptable that they even come and sit in Gwadar? We are not accepting it. So how do you accept, expect Russia when today itself in 1991, one of the major issues which Gorbachev brought out is NATO should not come in. Now, all East European countries have joined NATO. All East European, Poland, Latvia. I mean to say, what strengths do they have? What is their capability? How many can fight? The last war they have fought is the Second World War. How much time did it take for Hitler to capture Poland? Please go through history. All of you know history better than me. How much time did it take for all these Latin, all these republics to keep changing from side to side? I still remember visiting St. Petersburg. And I was told very clearly that Finland was, you know, given to these things. Three people who have attacked Russia till today. One was obviously Sweden. Second was ne France, that is Napoleon. And the third, obviously, it was the Germans. I don't think and anybody you can have NATO united. So what? What are you going to do? Can you use nuclear weapons? The answer is no. Can you use your aircraft? The answer is no. So therefore, you have to understand that you have to accommodate Russia as I think Ambassador Tugnet rightly called one is a hyperpower and the other is a superpower. With so many nuclear weapons, with all the devices, you can't say that they're just by not giving economy. Fine, today the dollar is powerful. Tomorrow you'll have the yuan taking its place. You'll say that's not practicable. Wall Street can't be replaced. Okay, and you can't today. What happens? I mean to say, okay, next you'll say, will China, India, is it acceptable to India that Russia and China comes close? Well, India has a very fine way of dealing with many people. I think, Sidhu, sir, you belong to India. At least you understand you've got Punjabis who possibly can't speak when they go to South India even today. So we know how to deal with countries. Our diversity is something. I have been posted all over India. I've just returned from the Jam Jammu and Kashmir. All right, I'm a Bengali. I have been posted all over India. I've been posted at many places in the world. Indians know how to adjust with everybody. We can adjust with China. We know how to deal with China. It's not that we are what you call going to suddenly occupy Tibet or no, not at all. But we know how to show them their place. Otherwise, why did China have the 15th round of conference of the core commanders just on Friday? Today is Monday. The next point which I want to bring, where will all this end? Any military campaign must have an end state. What does America want? Do they have an end state? What does the NATO have? Does it have an end state? That this is what we should end it. You want a ceasefire, Putin would like an end state. What is the end state? End state can't be ends ending sanctions. Everybody knows that the sanctions will never end. We have to live with sanctions. This is a part, sir. These are all hard people. Russians are very, very, you have to read books and you have to go and see Russia, how they can live on what you call crumbs if required in that cold winter. But the point is, we have got to see as to the end state which Russia wants in this case is very simple, one point. 
Ukraine should not join NATO. And I think it's a very good point. If Ukraine joins NATO, I'm afraid the world will cease to exist. I deal with weapons. I deal with missiles. I deal with nuclear weapons. I, I do agree these are political weapons, but politicians don't handle the weapons. Diplomats don't handle the weapons. Professors don't handle the weapons. Journalists don't handle the weapons. We handle them. And often there could be accidents. I mean, there's an open fact that we, at least on five occasions, very rightly or wrongly, nuclear weapons could have been used by the Soviet Union or the United States. We know it. So would you like them to sit next to each other, have the NATO hugging what you call the Western borders of Russia and see that the world doesn't exist? Is it something we are wishing? Certainly, if you say India is abstaining, I think India has had the common sense to do it. And you might say that India is looking for what, a five trillion, it will come to us. If we work hard, we will get it. Yeah. Now, today, as far as Vietnam is concerned, you watch it. I was posted to Vietnam for three years. Today, Vietnam is growing at the speed of what you call better than any Asian economy. Bangladesh is growing. It is not dependent on the United States of America and the US will come to India. I have seen what happens. Having bought weapons from you, tires from you, radars from you, and also guns from you, which are deployed today by us, and we are grateful to you. And everybody telling me they will not fire Indian ammunition, Our men will get killed. They are now firing Indian ammunition. We have made them do what we wanted them to do. So therefore, having told you, I would like to just say over here, the end state has possibly been reached by Russia. It is now at the peace table, and we hope that things would improve. So I'd like to rest my case over here, and we'd like to continue. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jana Chakravarti, for that very passionate and fact-ridden uh, uh, speech of yours. And uh, many of the points, I fully agree with you. And uh, if we know the history of Russia and the Russian people, I would say I would not talk about the czars and uh, the uh, Soviets leaders and others, but the people of Russia are very different than anywhere else in the world. And the Ukrainians, I would count them in the same breadth. But now we have, um, uh, we have to touch upon something that uh, we have really not touched upon, and that is uh, on the economic impact, global impact of these sanctions and this war. Uh, and since uh, Mr. Arun is not only a journalist, but also a, a noted economist, uh, I would request him to touch upon these things and how India can uh, confront these uh, secondary tertiary sanctions that are likely to come and which Professor Sidhu also mentioned about cuts and others. So floor is yours, Mr. Aram. Yeah, thank you. Before I come to discuss the economic impact, let me just add one opinion in support of what uh, Professor Chakrabarti said, Dr. Chakrabarti said. India's stance is not guided by its legacy or past relationship with, the, with Russia or the Soviet Union. It is guided by the future. Thus, India will want a world where Russia is sidelined, marginalized, ceases to be a power, a geopolitical uh, power center. And you want the world to be divided between the US with China as the other head. When the world was divided between two camps between the US and the Soviet Union, India could play one side off against the other and get concessions from both. That option is not available when one of the two hegemons is China, who is your border, which is across the border to the north and is trying to uh, you know, put pressure on your territory. Then you will be completely under the thumb of the US if you want to resist uh, China's pressure. That goes against the very root of India's policy of having strategic autonomy. It is in India's interest for Russia to continue as a viable geopolitical power center. And that is a one major reason that motivates India to act in the way that it has. Now, even if the war ends tomorrow, there are serious uh, economic uh, implications that have already been uh, caused 
unleashed and which will not go back uh, into the bottle uh, like any genie which can be called that. Oil prices have surged, gas prices have surged, uh, wheat and uh, oil seed prices have gone up. And these are things which cannot suddenly reverse. The, uh, the next sowing of wheat in Ukraine and Russia, in Ukraine basically, not Russia so much, has been affected. And which means there will be a shortage of wheat in the, for the foreseeable next six, seven months. And that will have its own implication for food prices. This comes at a time when the world is, is seeing heightened inflation as a result of COVID-related supply uh, bottlenecks. And these uh, pressures will increase the uh, tendency for prices to stay up and keep rising. Whenever there is any uncertainty in the global economy, there is a flight to safety of globally deployed capital. We have seen that in the Indian stock market. The FII's, the foreign portfolio investors, have dumped their investments in Indian stocks and Indian debt, and they have gone back to their home countries. This puts pressure on our exchange rate. The rupee has depreciated. Yes, we have some reserves with the RBI with which we can try to smoothen out the fluctuation in the value of the rupee, but it does create a strain on the system. When the RBI intervenes to stabilize the rupee and it sells dollars, then it is actually uh, uh, creating an additional uh, liquidity shortage. When it sells dollars, it is actually sucking up rupees. When the money supply comes, goes down, it tends to put upward pressure on interest rates. So we are witnessing a higher yield without the RBI changing its uh, basic monetary policy stance. And that is not very good for India at a time when the economic recovery is still very uh, nascent, incipient. And so these are all the consequences that have been created by the war in the short term. But there are longer term implications as well. The weaponization of the dollar that we saw with Iran uh, already had created problems even for the Europe. Europe had wanted to buy oil from Iran because they were part of the, uh, new, the Iran nuclear deal. And uh, they were not very happy when Trump walked out of it unilaterally. But because of the ability of the United States to use the dollar as leverage against all other countries in the world, they got away with it. But now, China and Russia will collaborate in creating an alternate payment mechanism. Now, this payment mechanism is not just a politically created controversy. The Bank for International Settlements has, through its innovation lab, already created a blockchain-based international cross-border payment system, which is independent of the dollar. Now, there will be additional impetus, impetus to these kinds of new technological blockchain-based uh, cross-border payment, which will greatly reduce the ability of the US to weaponize the dollar. And this is something that will get added impetus thanks to what has happened in the, in, the, in the wake of the Ukraine war and the sanctions that has been imposed. I do not think that the US will declare secondary sanctions. They have declared sanctions, yes. But secondary sanctions, which says that any entity that deals with a sanctioned entity in Russia will all face the same sanctions as the entity in Russia has faced. That's not going to happen because Europe needs to buy gas and oil from Russia. If you sanction every bank in Russia, then who does uh, Europe make payments to? It cannot. So you cannot sanction every bank in Russia. So, and that for the same reason, you cannot have secondary sanctions. Because if you declare a blanket secondary sanctions, again, the result will be to cut off all means of settling payments for the gas they buy for Europe from Russia. And Europe just cannot afford to do that. So right now, there are no prospects of secondary sanctions. And we should be, India should be uh, happily willing to buy Russian oil. We should be happily willing to uh, sell them whatever produce they need. I would say that we should also be willing to settle Russia's external payment obligations. 
we actually run a current account deficit, which means we have to pay Russians money. That money, instead of paying directly to Russians, through a simple change in procedural rules, the RBI can ask Indian uh, uh, importers to settle their dues with whoever Russia has to settle their, make their payments to. So that is uh, something that is uh, entirely possible to me. And we will not face any sanctions from the US because of this, because there are no secondary sanctions. Another big change that is going to happen, that every country in the world is going to increase their arms expenditure. Every country. Germany has already said it will raise its defense budget to 2% of GDP. And it has lost its uh, historic uh, you know, defensiveness on defense. It is uh, exporting arms to many countries, now exporting arms to uh, Ukraine also. South Korea has become uh, an exporter of weapons. Japan very clearly sees that the US will talk the talk, but will not necessarily walk the talk. And therefore, it is going to become more self land for its own defense, which means we, will, we should be prepared to see a change in the Japanese constitution, which Abe tried to carry out, but didn't succeed. But now the material pressure is much more on Japan to do that and come out openly as a normal country with its defense capability, not trammeled by external uh, obligations. If Japan becomes uh, more uh, normal in terms of its defense capability, you cannot expect to see Korea uh, sitting uh, behind and not doing uh, what is required to be done for its own defense. So we are going to see an increased military outlays by countries across the world. Now, this means there will be cut back in the money that is required for a great many other things, which will have its own uh, implications for economic activity, for the kind of goods that are produced, the kind of money they are available to spare on uh, various other things, and that will have its own implications. Another area is energy. Now Europe wants to structurally liberate itself from dependence on Russian oil and gas. The only way can, they can do that is, is by accelerating the green transition. You Already they have been planning to decarbonize economies and move away from dependence on uh, gas. So I would think that there will be a greater investment in nuclear energy. The, the small modular reactors of fusion energy that have been talked about, they are, that technology is being made more perfect. Germany will reverse its policy of not using uh, nuclear power to meet its energy requirements. So we will see a big resurgence in nuclear power. We will see even nuclear fusion in which some major advances made earlier this year that will also probably be uh, reach increasingly commercial uh, possibility. And these are things that uh, both pose uh, an opportunity and a challenge to India. So India cannot lag behind when the rest of the world is moving ahead on these uh, technological uh, fronts in the way energy is produced and consumed. And it is high time, I would think, that India started going beyond its pilot project on our domestically sourced thorium-based uh, fast breeder reactor and uh, made bold to accelerate that program. Now the US has uh, sanctioned uh, Russian oil, but the US is a major importer of Russian uranium. They haven't put any brakes on that. Now, I think uh, the, the nuclear energy is going to only increase in global importance. And we, India should also be part of that uh, activity. And we should also step up our own research and our own capability in producing nuclear energy. So in all these areas, we are going to see a major shift, even if the peace talks succeed and the war in Ukraine comes to an end uh, day after tomorrow. And I hope uh, it does. Uh, nobody is in favor of war. But after Germany attacked Poland, was it really feasible for other countries in Europe to say, oh no, war is such a bad thing, we should sit on our hands and look on as Germany goes around conquering the rest of the world? 
So some wars are thrust upon people. And sometimes wars will not be fought. That is why we have armies and we prepare for action. And India's, it is in India's interest for the world to be multipolar and not to be bipolar. And it is in India's interest for Russia to continue as a viable center of geopolitical power. And thanks to what uh, the US has done from Trump's time and the unilateralism that Biden has shown in declaring uh, sanctions against Russia in terms of oil. And earlier the way they had edged out uh, France from this submarine deal with Australia, Europe is going to create its own geopolitical uh, force, it will try to create its own uh, identity outside NATO. And we will see one more center of global power coming up, that is Europe, which is separate from uh, America. And I think India has to prepare to deal with uh, these, all these major changes. And I'm sure we can do it. I don't think the trouble with major problem with uh, India is that our media discourse is sort of informed by Western media and their commentary. And this, I think, creates some problem in having clarity as to what exactly is India's national interest in all these areas. And I think it is good that we have discussions like these to clarify these issues. I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arun, for that very profound uh, analysis. Uh, and very hopeful, I had a lot of hope that there would be no secondary sanctions. Um, but it depends on the way the war goes, actually, and how, in my view, uh, Putin is going to play out. Because currently, one looks at uh, the overall objective. Uh, if you were to look at it from the US deep state's perspective is to uh, denude Russia of its power, basically, even its superpower status. Right. Sending a message to the Chinese who are an economic giant uh, to somehow that we have this kind of a financial power and we can cripple anyone and everybody. But the, I don't know who has miscalculated, whether it is the Western countries or whether it is uh, Russia or China, because they have been working in quite a close nexus, not from now, but when Putin was there and from, uh, in January for the Beijing Olympics as a chief guest, at that time, the, such a huge document that they signed, and they have been working on the, creating new mechanisms which are countering SWIFT. Even the Europeans were fed up when the Iranian thing happened, you know that. And uh, so I, I think that uh, we are looking at a very different kind of a world now. I mean, and it's difficult to predict, but hopefully the countries like India will not face the economic sanctions because unless the Americans wish to kill the goose, uh, that is golden goose, I guess, because uh, as Professor Sidhu was mentioning, uh, defense is very important. And as General Chakravarti also mentioned, it's difficult to get things from USA because then they have the dual use, they have all kinds of restrictions, licensing and all that. I have served in Russia for seven years and I have served as trade commissioner in the US also. So I have seen both hands and I know that it is uh, it, it becomes increasingly difficult to deal with them because then they want to keep uh, all the eggs in their own hands. So th this is something that sometimes causes a major problem in dealing with them. Now, of course, fortunately, we have signed all those uh, three primary agreements and uh, LEMOA and others. So interoperability is becoming far more important and useful. Uh, and I believe that that is something that will go long. With. And from the discussions which are held in uh, this um, uh, Quad Summit, uh, and bilaterally that Jashankar has been talking to Blinken and elsewhere in Munich security conference and everywhere. I think that this has been very clearly mentioned to them. And I don't buy this, that we are only not doing anything or against Russia just because uh, we have arms and ammunition from Russia. Uh, I mean, India has already now, if you were to go through the CIPRI yearbook last one, from 70%, we have reduced it to 43%. We are importing more than $20 billion worth from the United States. And also from Israel is our third largest partner. France is coming in the middle, wanting to do the nuclear submarines and all kinds of things with us. But one thing so far, uh, and Professor Sidhu can tell us better, the problem in the Indian uh, establishment also is, at the public psyche is, that the trust for the Americans 
has been missing. That when you really need them, and I think that during this time, the Ukrainian message and uh, Ukraine from Ukraine, the message that goes to the world and those uh, friends of USA is that when the really it comes to the brass tacks, you may not count on uh, USA that much. We have seen in China, they are following exactly the same policy that India is doing, competition with cooperation. So I think that uh, this is something we need to, uh, to, to look at. Now, the, I, we have, I think, individually answered all the questions which are there in the Q&A. And uh, Mr. Arun, you also have one question there for you. Rest, uh, Professor Sidhu has answered. I have also written that. But I'll, uh, now, Professor Sidhu, maybe perhaps your closing comments, and then we will pass on to Dr. Mehta. Um, all right, thank you very much. I wasn't uh, I wasn't planning to, but but I'm I'm very happy to sort of jump in uh, into the discussion. I think one thing hearing this discussion is very interesting. Uh, it raises two questions in my mind. Neither one of them, uh, you know, I feel very qualified to respond on my on, on my own. But you know, certainly others others on the panel might be able to uh, able to do that. Uh, number one. Um, is, is India's objective of becoming a $5 trillion economy possible uh, without globalization? Uh, is, it, is, it, is it possible with the, uh, with the multipolarity that we've been talking about? Uh, or is it that the drivers of globalization are really some sort of parts of the, the, the country as well? The second idea of India, uh, it also sounds like uh, India is already, even if it does become a $5 trillion economy, has already relegated its position to that of a balancing power rather than a leading power. Uh, one that can never in some ways in its own mind lead that it will always need uh, other countries to balance with or uh, against. Uh, and, and I think that in some ways kind of, you know, puts in the broader context of something that perhaps uh, India needs to think about uh, as, as well. Mm, I think just in the context of the, uh, of the United States, uh, you know, as I was saying, this is a multi-dimensional uh, relationship uh, government to government has only ever been one part of it. Uh, I think uh, the diaspora is equally important, as indeed are the corporate sector. Uh, also, the fact uh, that you actually have much greater emphasis here on uh, the private uh, sector, which is why you will have more companies uh, bidding and challenging the, there as well, compared to state-owned enterprises, you know, which are which are going forward. Um, I think uh, I'll, I'll make two points and kind of end, end with that. This question about, uh, you know, the uh, US support being lackluster. Maybe one thought experiment which might be uh, interesting for us to do is look at the amount of statements supporting India's position against China uh, on Galvan. Uh, that came out over the last couple of years, and certainly in 2020, and compare that with the number of statements of support that came from Russia uh, or any other any other country. Uh, and I think that might give you one kind of marker of how you might want to measure, uh, you know, this this element of of support or or, or lack of it uh, there as well. The other element, I think. Uh, you know, is that it's always much, much more challenging, uh, particularly for the US to do uh, defense business in particular with non-allies. Uh, and this is something, you know, which is, which is very, very unique. And part of it is of course, uh, got to do with the alliance system, but also this understanding that India can never be part of the alliance system. But it's not just it's not just that uh, aspect of it. It's also uh, this concern about uh, the, the transfer of technology and where it might end up. For example, uh, would India be comfortable selling any of its advanced technology to a country knowing that it might land up in China or in Pakistan? 
Uh, and unless that's not possible, then I think, you know, there's a similar kind of logic which might be flowing uh, out, out of the US uh, here as well. Given all of these constraints, uh, as, uh, as Ambassador uh, Trignat, you pointed out, uh, I think this relationship, certainly on the, on the security and the military front between the US and, uh, and India has gone much further uh, and perhaps much faster than it may be comfortable for, for a, lot of, uh, a lot of people uh, to, to go. Um, but I think it is, it is uh, the nature of this polity between the two that I think which is, which is important uh, uh, as, 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 as well. Uh, I just see one more, uh, one more uh, brief comment, I think, which has come up. Uh, no, I don't actually, my apologies. But thank you, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Professor Do. That's uh, exactly what you mentioned is correct uh, to a great extent. But uh, a few points, uh, if I may add. Uh, you know, uh, the, the transfer of technology is something that India has been insisting because of its um, long ago, earlier we used to call it self-reliance, import substitution mechanisms and all that. And then Dr. Manmohan Singh, as you know, I used to be in New York at the time, we started economic reforms. And then today we are looking at something called Atnirbhar Bharat with it by a different name, but with a different context. Because today India is trying to become a part of the global value supply chain through its own interdependencies, which it has, it has identified during the pandemic vis-a-vis -vis China. So India's biggest problem is not Russia, it's not US, it is China, which will remain its problem. Now, of course, USA made statements for India. Trump could say anything, whatever it is. But it was essentially in the context of their own geopolitical contestation with China, not necessarily for India. And this, uh, the strategist, you know it, that this is India figures prominently in their uh, equation. So India has to leverage that. I mean, I'm saying simply, there are no friends, it's only national interests. So we have to look at that. Secondly, as far as Russia is concerned, it did not make his, any statement openly because it also has a very close strategic partnership and in the global context that serves its purpose with China. But what it did to you, Russia had at that time, when we needed any kind of arms equipments, we gave them a list of about 43 items, our defense minister went there and they said, we will just give it to you. Giving S-400 to us, China is not happy. It's not only the US, China is also not happy that Russia is giving it to us, but the Russians have gone again, given to us. Secondly, in 99 Kargil war, when I was there, I have seen it. No other country will help you the way the Russians will come up to Europe because, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about these here on this platform, but we have seen in practice uh, the, the way they have come to. So that has generated a lot of, uh, I think the, the, the popular perception that you need a friend and the friend who can stand up for you. Of course, USA is, uh, everybody says. So that's why in the beginning itself, I discounted the privileged strategic partnership with Russia and, and the global comprehensive and coming to what India can do and should do. So thank you very much. That was very nice. And the uh, last few points, um, Dr. Mehta, I'll hand over to you. Uh, yes, thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Sidhu wants to respond. Okay. Uh, no, no, actually, not, not so much to this, although I think this is a very important point. Uh, just to say that even in the US, uh, in the India, uh, Russia and Soviet relationship, there was never transfer of technology. Uh, they were very happy to sell, uh, you know, the, the, the goods and, and material. But uh, this is one of the things which India was never able to uh, crack, even with uh, Russia and the Soviet Union before that. But I just wanted to pick up on two things. One actually from uh, Professor uh, Vijay Lakshmi, which I think is very important to, to uh, keep in mind here as well, is the other dimensions of this war, you know, which is really that it's also being fought out in social media and in reputational loss. Uh, and I think this is something that every country needs to keep in mind uh, going forward as to how, you know, that's going to be an important role. And the last thing I'll sort of say, uh, Ambassador, is something that you raised right in the beginning, is the weaponization of trade and finance. And I think this is the new reality that one will have to address with. It's not entirely new 
for example, if you look at, uh, you know, how India is using um, uh, um, the, uh, the financial um, uh, arrangements to counter some of Pakistan's actions uh, as well, uh, you can see that this is really becoming part of the new arsenal that others would also be also be using. And so, uh, you know, this old approach of just having surpluses is not going to be enough. But I think there's a more fundamental question as to how do you deal with this notion of globalization? Do you entirely jettison it uh, and sort of, you know, go back to just being uh, isolated and then, you know, what was then called the Hindu rate of growth, et cetera, which has its own pros and cons, or, uh, do, you, do you go ahead with globalization, recognizing that there are these additional uh, risks as well? But thank you. Thank you again very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Arun, sir, you have uh, raised your hand. Uh, sir, if you could also take this question on, um, you know, the sanctions are increasing day by day against Russia. And um, just today we have... Um, one uh, one article by editorial by Professor Ashok Gulati on Ukraine to UP in the Indian Express. So uh, does could this mean uh, a, be, a somewhat a sort of uh, a silver lining for the Indian economy in terms of food and um, other prices? Yeah, yeah, I mean that's a very straightforward answer. If there is a shortage of wheat, India has some huge amount of wheat in our stock. 20 million tons or which we are which are surplus, which India doesn't need. And India can easily sell them in the international market. So that's not like a big deal. Now, I want to say one reason why there will be no secondary sanctions is that if secondary sanctions are to be announced, they will have to be announced against China, not against just one company in China, but against the Chinese economy across the board. And this is not something that the world can afford. China's exports last year amounted to $3.6 trillion. $3.6 trillion is larger than India's GDP. That was China's exports. The world relies on China's exports to a large extent to keep its supply of consumer goods flowing, to contain inflation. If those goods are kept out, shut out, sanctioned out, then the world is going to see very, very difficult times. America is going to see very difficult times. Europe is going to face very difficult times. So that is why there will be no secondary sanction. Second, uh, Dr. Sidhu's point, there is no you know, choice, mutually exclusive choice between globalization and multipolarity. Even as the US and China were engaged in a trade war, China had opened up its financial markets to Western financial companies. Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and such other companies were getting into asset management in Shanghai, even as the trade war was going on. So global finance is much more integrated today than they were in 2015. So just because there is strategic competition, it doesn't mean that economic uh, integration cannot happen simultaneously. I can see very well that right now, there is going to be technological nationalism. Technology and nationalism. China is developing its own microelectronic uh, technology, its own semiconductor industry, which the Americans are trying to put a uh, ban on uh, against sales to China. Now it does ban sales to Russia. Russia and China both are will try to develop their own uh, advanced uh, technology. So will India. If China today has mastery of quantum communications, India will be a fool if India doesn't try to reach there on its own. India will. So there will be a technology nationalism. At the same time, at various other levels, the world will continue to grow ever more interdependent. The developed countries are going old. They have surplus savings, which need to be deployed where growth is, from where they can generate a return, and with that return, pay pension. So the world will continue to globalize. And uh, regardless of what happens at the strategic level, this is not the kind of world where uh, Russia and the Soviet Union tried to present a separate economic paradigm. There is no separate economic paradigm now. Every country is capitalist. And they will continue to integrate, be interdependent financially, interdependent on trade on a whole lot of uh, commodities which are non-strategic. 
and they, that kind of globalization will continue regardless of there being uh, multipolarity and strategic competition between the different poles thank you thank you sir uh, major general your uh, final thoughts if you'd like to share please unmute okay uh, i think everything has been covered i found the question that has already been answered and it's regarding you know the relation between how china has abstained and india has abstained and everybody has covered it i will not get into further details all that i would say is militarily i don't think things are going to go further it's up to the united states and europe to decide how to continue giving all these anti tank weapons and hot missiles and triggering the ukrainians to do much more than on one hand you have got refugees going let's be very clear about it 2.2 million refugees in 19 days if you look at bangladesh 6 months how many refugees moved to india just calculate i have got the figures with me which country has had 2.2 million refugees moving out of this is not my figure it is a figure given by the united nations not by russia or something so if 2.2 million are moving and today itself about 30000 people are leaving kiev right now so therefore please i would request better sense must prevail don't have too much faith in countries like latvia poland romania that they can fight they have never fought historically if you have not fought fighting is not something that we go to the school and you learn it takes a long time for a nation to learn how to fight you learn it the real hard way there's no school for fighting there's no academy we taught the afghans how to fight in our academy they ran away the us taught them everybody taught them so my view is we should stop encouraging all this see the broader picture which ukraine is seeing let me tell you their foreign minister when they sat down at what you call anatelia you hear the views i heard that conference both sides even putin said it's nice to see that even zelensky said that the russians please let us not trigger this by declaring 200 million dollars of anti tank weapons what will the what are these anti tank weapons going to do which one tank going what difference does it make even 100 tanks being destroyed what difference does it make could you stop could the us stop the vietnamese tanks from entering saigon they had to run away in a helicopter could they stop the taliban from entering kabul i'm just asking this to all of you it's not to the united states please see the reality on the wall if the indian embassy has moved to poland please understand ambassador trugnaet is sitting here how difficult it is for an ambassador to move out of a country we had cambodia under trouble when hun sen was there the indian government doesn't give you permission to move out under all odds till they ensure that so will bear me out and i was looking after it till every indian who is supposed to vacate that country is safely evacuated so therefore if the indian embassy has moved to poland i think good sense must prevail not in relying on what information is being fed through social media and all these and making somebody a super power and calling somebody names now that's not the way things work weapons speak for themselves an aircraft is a bigger aircraft a fighter is a fighter and please i think that reality must dawn upon us let's give diplomacy a chance which all of you have i think said so let's give them a chance let the ukrainians and the russians decide and i think we should not keep encouraging 250 million dollars aid of anti tank weapons hot missile these will make no difference you have left 95 billion dollars worth of equipment in afghanistan people don't even i think they have become toys now this 95 billion dollars worth of on one hand the us is, people are crying that 79 cents per gallon siddu sir will be able to tell us is the increase in rate of petrol despite biden releasing the study 79 cents is the rise 
So this is the way the US is suffering due to sanctions. Look at it. So I would like to say, please, we should, I think, now cool down, all of us, including myself. And I would like to thank and just end over here. Thank you. Thank you, Major General. Uh, Ambassador Anil Trigunayat, your final words before we continue. Let's give diplomacy a chance. And that's it. The war must stop. And I hope for both Putin and Zelensky are able to. Already there are some good hopeful signs which are coming from both sides. So, as but as I, all, I said, that this is geopolitics. It is not a small war in, in, in that area. So it is much more at stake for everybody. And we'll see it in a few days' time how it plays out. But it's been unfortunate. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. Uh, so yes, uh, I uh, this has truly been very enriching uh, panel discussion, and uh, I would like to just formally conclude uh, with the uh, formal vote of thanks. Before that, uh, I would like to reiterate that IMPRI Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies stands and unequivocally supports peaceful resolution of all disputes and calls for an immediate end to all violence. So on behalf of the center, I would like to propose the formal vote of thanks. My sincere gratitude to our esteemed panelists, Professor W.P.S. Sidhu, Major General P.K. Chakravarti, Mr. T.K. Arun, and to the chair of the session, Ambassador Anil Trigunayat. Um, Honorable Ambassador of the Royal Danish Embassy, Mr. Freddy Swan, uh, we are privileged to have had your uh, participation. I would also like to thank all our viewers, including representatives from different embassies, high commissions and consulates from India here on Zoom, and also all those who are watching us on Facebook Live. I also thank all those who would be watching us, watching the deliberation later on our YouTube channel or listening to the podcast on different platforms. Hope you will join us again in our future events. Thank you and wish you all a great rest of the day and week ahead. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Everyone. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.